My name is Jenny Breckis. I'm the Northern Section Director for the Northern Chapter of the Northern Section of the Nevada Chapter of the American Planning Association. Uh, together with Scenic Nevada, we are pleased to bring you the Trekkie Meadows Livable Communities Lecture Series. This is our second in our five-week program of lectures on uh, livable communities, which is uh, funded by a grant that our two organizations received from the John Ben Snow Memorial Trust. Uh, Chris Leinberger is our speaker today. He's an urban theorist and developer, now based in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's written articles that have been published by the Brookings, published by and in the Brookings Institute, Urban Land Institute, where his article uh, on financing smart growth was the, uh, the publication's 2003 article of the year. He's also been published in Atlantic Monthly and uh, written about in the Wall Street Journal. For 20 years, he owned the country's largest real estate consulting firm, uh, based in LA, uh, Charles, I was, Robert Charles Lesser. That's it. And in 1997, he formed his own development, development company, Arcadia Land Company, that currently is constructing projects in Philadelphia, Kansas City, and a 12 block redevelopment area in Albuquerque. And also has a project in Seaside, Florida. He's one of the most interesting people, I think, writing about <coughs> working in urban America today, both. Um, in theory and in implementing his vision for uh, urban uh, development and new ur urbanism. <laughs> for those of you who were here last week or will be here over the next few weeks, she probably says that about everybody, so I <laughs> take that with a very large grain of salt. Um, I want to talk about the future of our country. <laughs> of our cities, um, and believe it or not, it's a pretty bright future. And, but let me first show you the way that most of us see our cities and see, our, and see where 80% of us live in our uh, metropolitan areas, and it's, it's obviously a tale of two cities, and I've been living in Santa Fe for the last 18 years, and here's a town that is much beloved, one of the largest concentrations of uh, specialty retail in the country, one of the top five largest, 650 little shops, only eight nationals, all the rest are mom and pops, all within walking distance of the plaza. Um, the plaza is very well used, laid out by the law of the Indies, the, that great uh, 1560s law handed down by the, by the King of Spain that almost all of the settlements here in North America were uh, laid out, all the Spanish, the, uh, Spanish uh, settlements. And it's a place that, you know, three million people come per year to this little town at 7,000 feet, uh, this little town of 60,000 people, but they come from Los Angeles and New York and Dallas to have urbanity. Um, but everyday reality for most of us in this country is a little different. Uh, it doesn't matter where this is. I could tell you that it's Philadelphia. I could tell you that it's St. Louis. I could tell you that it's Albuquerque. I could tell you that it's Santa Fe, because this is Santa Fe as well. This is Surreal's Road, and you have Surreal's Roads, and everybody has Surreal's Roads throughout the country. And this is how we tend to live. 80 percent, 90 percent of the uh, of the landscape is covered in asphalt to move and park cars. It's, um, one could only say that it's beautiful. Um, uh, I mean, this is how we live our lives. And um, and it's a could be anywhere USA. But it's not only USA. Uh, my wife and I were in, um, it, were in Prague last fall and um, taking the uh, freeway in from Germany in, uh, in the uh, Czech Republic. And this is where the freeway ends in glorious Prague, one of the most beautiful cities on the planet. This is the north side of the freeway, which is a super regional mall. Here's the south side of the freeway with a McDonald's and a, uh, and a, a big box center. Uh, and across the way was a, was, was a row of, uh, of uh, car dealerships. This is what we're doing throughout the world. And you go to the, th to the second beltway outside of Paris and it looks pretty much like a small version of the third beltway outside of Houston. But the real focus is China where 40% of the building activity on the planet is taking place, pushing up prices everywhere throughout the world, and they're following the same pattern. 
And it's known as conventional development. We invented it here in this country. It's simple. It's modular, meaning that it's, that it's self-contained, that the only thing that it has in common with the rest of the built environment is the six or eight lane highway in front of it. it tends to be segregated by income and race. It's very formula driven. I'll talk more about that. And, but the key issue is that like all transportation, or, or, or like all cities, cities for 8,000 years are dictated by the transportation system. We have one transportation system, it's car and trucks. And it's, it's basically highways. And that transportation system has dictated, and I don't want to go into all the details of how this has happened, it has dictated into a very suburban, low density model. And it can only be suburban, it can only be low density because we've got to move and park those cars. And we've got to do them cheaply. And the long story short, however, is is that we are building a disposable environment. That the suburban model that we're following is A, heavily subsidized. That's now been pretty well proven over the last 15, 20 years that there's massive subsidies being given to it. And it's, it, therefore it means that it's de facto public policy that we build this. And that it must be built at a very low density where only 10 or 20% of the land is actually consumed by buildings in our commercial districts, the rest is put under asphalt. In our residential districts, it's landscaping and lawns. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with this stuff. I mean, this is what a large percentage of the market wants. This is what we all thought over the last 50 years was just heaven on earth. But, we, but it should not be subsidized. It should not be public policy. That there is one way to live in this country, and the only way you can live is in a suburban model, and we're going to subsidize it massively. And by the way, it is not just a little subsidy. It's anywhere from 9 to 1 subsidized to 20 to 1 subsidized, based upon which category of infrastructure you're talking about. It's massively subsidized. And what it has resulted in over the last 15 years in particular is what I refer to as the 19 standard product types. These are the product types that we in real estate know how to build, know how to finance, and, oh, by the way, are legal. Because if you don't build the 19 standard product types, what you're building is illegal. You have to get variances from the city code to build them. These 19 standard product types are all that, that very simple, standalone products. They're all outstanding in their field, literally, not figuratively. And the one that I always like to talk about is the grocery anchored retail, because we all go to a grocery anchored retail. And let me explain, or let me describe perhaps how you spent the afternoon or you might spend tomorrow morning at the grocery anchored retail. It's a 12 to 15 acre retail center. 20% is covered by single story buildings. The other 80% is under asphalt. The parking is always in the front. The buildings are towards the back. It's anchored by a 50,000 square foot grocery store, a national chain, at one end. The other end is probably a drugstore, 20, 25,000 square feet. In between are all those hometown favorites, such as the Hallmark card shop, and the, I can't believe it's yogurt store. Um, and it is on the going home side of the street, at least 25,000 cars per day. And this thing is going to look the same whether it's in Reno, Santa Fe, or Washington, D.C., or California. The only difference is that it will have an architectural twist to it. The last 15 seconds of the design process, uh, if it's in California, they'll put little uh, Mediterranean tiles on them. <laughs> in Santa Fe, they'll put little Vegas sticking out and coat it in, 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 in plaster. And back east, it'll be a brick uh, facade. But they're all the same. And they're now traded. All of these 19 product types are all traded on Wall Street. Either their equity, the ownership, or the debt, the mortgage, is traded in a multi-trillion dollar business. The largest business, by the way, the, the largest part of the financial market today. The corporate debt that was floated in 2002 was $1.2 trillion. The real estate debt that was floated on Wall Street was $1.4 trillion. 
in, in, uh, in uh, 2004. It's a huge business. It's, it's, it's easy to do business if you follow these 19 standard product types. But these 19 standard product types don't allow for anything but suburban sprawl. Now, I, I've, I've used this term progressive development. Other people, uh, it's basically a catch-all for smart growth and new urbanism and downtown turnarounds and for uh, conservation development and for corridor redevelopment. Whole variety of new progressive ways of building our cities. What they have in common is that they're complex places. They have a lot of uses. They're integrated. They aren't transported by a huge uh, Huey helicopter and dropped down in a could-be-anywhere fashion. They grow from the dirt. And the key is walkability. There's a lot of different transportation methods used to get people there and to get them around these places, whether it be bicycles or, or transit or cars or trucks. Um, but the base is walkability. The thing that we forget is that only 60% of us drive. The other 40% are too young, too old, or too poor, and they have to be driven by somebody else. So we built this system for the 60%, not for the 40%, and especially the kids, they can't get around. The walkability is absolutely key, and it's been the key to city building for, oh, a mere 8,000 years. It's only been in the last 50 that we've forgotten it. And I think in retrospect, 20 years from now, as this more progressive way of developing becomes more the norm, we're going to look at suburban development as, as basically ahistorical. It was a break from the past, it was the pendulum swinging too far, and we're going to come back into a more middle uh, position. But it's a fundamentally different product, and there really is only two choices. There's the suburban model, and there's the progressive model where walkability is the core to it. And there's not anything in between. I've looked for decades to see if there's something in between. There isn't. It's one choice or, or the other, and we can have both. They just don't relate to one another. And it, since it is a free country, obviously the market should have whatever it wants. But the thing that we've done in this country is that we've, again, this de facto public policy that we're going to subsidize sprawl dramatically and conventional de uh, uh, development dramatically. And when you try to take those subsidies away, I'll tell you, because I've been involved with it out in New Mexico, um, when you take subsidies away from developers or you take candy away from kids, they scream. <laughs> and it's not pretty. Um, but it has two different financial characteristics. It has to be financed differently but it has different results. The, red, the um, bottom chart there is time. The top is value created or cash flow or the price per square foot, however you want to measure uh, value. And for those of you that can't balance your checkbooks, you can just, I'll come back to uh, Earth in just a second. The red line is how I've seen conventional development perform. It peaks around year seven, as far as its financial performance. <coughs> and then it begins to decline in its value. And the reason is, is because it's built cheaply, and conventional development cannot measure long-term value creation. And just real quickly for you financial jocks out there, that it's because we, we in real estate and the entire financial world uses a concept called discounted cash flow. It's also known as net present value, internal rate of return. It's a measurement device that just has a bias. It can't see beyond year seven. And I don't want to get into detail on that, but that's why we don't build things that last any longer than seven years or so. And the way we do that is we continue to cheapen the construction. And why do we cheapen it? Because we don't believe demand's going to be there for longer than seven or ten years. Because sprawl always takes demand further and further out. So why invest in any one location for any length of time? So as a result, we're building these cities to throw them away. And considering that real estate as an asset class 
represents over a third of the asset value of our country. If you're going to buy the country, it costs you about $50 trillion. About a third of that money that you're writing out of your checkbook is for the real estate. And we're building this stuff to dispose of it. Now, the blue line is how I believe urban real estate, walkable real estate, progressive real estate performs. And not just now, but for time immemorial. And it's because an upward spiral of value creation takes place. That a great downtown is always the most expensive place to do business and also um, where the most value is created. And it's very simple to see it. I mean, where's the most expensive place to buy real estate in this country? Midtown Manhattan. Where's number two? Downtown Chicago. Where's number three? Downtown San Francisco. And then, you know, go out of that stratosphere and drop down to Denver, where 15 years ago, downtown Denver, you could shoot a cannon off and not hit anybody after 4 o'clock. It had a 40% vacancy rate in its office stock. Today, they're selling condos for $500 a square foot. They have a massive affordable housing problem in downtown Denver. If you would have said 15 years ago that downtown Denver was going to have an affordability problem, people would have laughed at you. But that upward spiral took off. And that's what that blue line represents. And I'll get back to the gentrification question towards the end of this conversation. But the thing is, is that it performs differently. The reason it performs differently is because you've built a higher quality product up front, which means that your financial returns in the early years are not as good. In the mid to long term, they're far superior. But current financial methods of, of trying to evaluate that stuff, they're, they're just blind to it. The best analogy I've been able, able to come up with is that, that financiers looking at long-term investments are sort of like somebody who goes into the forest to see if a tree makes a sound when it falls. And they bring their thermometer and they say, nope, makes no sound. I can't measure it. It's the same thing with the way that they're evaluating investments in downtown, smart growth, walkable places. They just can't measure it, they can't see it, they're blind to it. But it's some of the most powerful real estate investments in the world, but we're not doing it very, very much in this country right now. Now, where can these places go? It's not just downtown. Downtown's important, and it's the most natural place. But it's cores, second generation cores that were developed back in the 50s. Uh, the Texas Medical Center south of uh, downtown Houston, uh, uptown Dallas, northwest of Dallas, uh, suburban downtowns, White Plains, north of New York City, Stanford, Connecticut, Wayne, Pennsylvania, which is where my Philadelphia office is, around universities are fabulous. And I, al I always mean to change this. This is, of course, Harvard Square. <laughs> I went there, I should know. Um, it's Harvard Square, the University of Texas in Austin, Penn has just done a phenomenal job in West, in uh, West Philly that Penn used to be a typical university that turned inward and was defensive in how it dealt with its slum that was around it. Over the last 15 years, it's, it's, it's now embraced its community. And it's a very hip, exciting place now. And the interesting thing is, and this is the economic development power of this, is that 15 years ago, Penn was considered the fallback Ivy League school. In fact, it was kind of nasty. Um, the Princeton team, when they would come down to play Penn in football, they would go across the field to the Penn side, and they'd have a cheer that went, fall back, fall back, school. Very nasty. But today, Penn is in the top five. Check your US News and World Report. Penn has just emerged as one of the great schools in this country. And I, I think a major reason for it is because it's now in a hip, exciting place to go to school. Fifteen years ago, it was known as the murder capital of, of the entire Ivy League. Um, Transit-oriented uh, development is a great place for these kind of things. And, and the best place to go to understand this is back to D.C. Washington put in their metro system. And in fact, it was interesting, in yesterday's times, um, they had a list of the most walkable cities in the country. And naturally, Portland was up there in New York City and Boston. But number one was Arlington, Virginia. 
And the reason is because of the metro system. The courthouse stop and the Boston stop, both of those stops on the metro line in Arlington would be slums today. Today, within, a, within walking distance of those stations is mixed use, exciting retail, apartments, great ethnic restaurants, uh, a very exciting place. It blew me away that it was the number one walkable city in the country. New suburban centers are also emerging. Greenfield, Addison Circle is probably one of the best examples in, in the country, which is north of Dallas. But the best one is Reston Town Center outside of Washington, where it has no transit. It's on the Dallas Access Road, and it's got retail, housing, office, and the housing's going for $600 a square foot. It's the highest housing in Virginia, is in Reston Town Center. And then the other place, which is sort of a new trend, are corridors. And this is, not, this is pretty new, and the best example is in Little Albuquerque. East of downtown, called East Downtown, Edo, is this <coughs> fabulous little place that is emerging, and it's going to sound strange, but this, this former obsolete retail, obsolete motel, kind of a hot sheet motel place, um, is evolving, it's beginning to look downright Parisian, the, the up and down this corridor. Three-story brick buildings, balconies, right up to the sidewalk, retail on the ground level, all within the last three years. Now, with your downtown, how do you turn this around? How do you make, in particular, your downtowns vibrant? Because you need to start downtown, and by the way, I gotta tell you, I was here six months ago for a conference and I got a little taste of downtown, but not really much. And I got, Jenny gave me a much better view today. And um, you're actually, I think, in better shape than downtown Albuquerque right now. And we've been at it for six years and we've been viewed, we've been called one of the fastest downtown turnarounds ever in the country. Um, that there's a lot going on here. I am really impressed. Um, now, it's not to say that it couldn't happen faster and there couldn't be more happening, but you, you tend to start, there's about, uh, uh, there's an article that I'll give you the website on in just a, uh, a, a minute, that you need to, s to lay a foundation for your downtown, that you need to really begin to understand that you're dealing with the largest mixed-use real estate project in the entire region. And most downtowns don't view themselves as a organic whole and they don't manage themselves. Um, the typical strip mall has an asset management function that's trying to <laughs> reposition it in the market constantly, and it's managed 24-7. But our downtowns generally are not. And so, you, A, you have to first start with the intention that you want a great downtown. And it's gonna take a lot of work. And, but you've got something that is so powerful downtown and especially for us gray hairs, that you've got the memory of what it was. And that memory drives emotion, that drives people to do things with your downtown that you would never do with a obsolete regional mall. You know, nobody is, you know, back in Washington, nobody's gonna write a song about I left my heart at Tyson's Corner, which is a big regional mall outside of Washington. But they do have a passionate commitment to downtown. And that passionate commitment translates into action and investments that you wouldn't get any other place in the, uh, in the entire uh, metro area. With that commitment, then the second thing is there's a need to do strategic planning. You have to look at this as a business opportunity. It's a complex business that needs a complex set of solutions. Because what you're trying to build in a downtown is a walkable place that within 1,500 feet, that's walkable. That's what has been walkable for 8,000 years. Maybe we can walk 1,600 feet because we're a little taller. But it's pretty much 1,500 feet, which when you run your math is about a plus or minus 20%, about 160 acres. That's about what your downtown is. And that's what Midtown is, and that's what downtown uh, New York is, and that's what downtown Albuquerque is. It's about 160 acres, plus or minus 20, 25%. And within those 15, uh, 160 acres, which, by the way, is the size of a super regional mall, just to give you another context. 
or as my wife always likes to say, 160 football fields. We always measure things in football fields here. Um, that in that 160 acres, you need walkability, which means no surface parking lots. It means retail that will pull you down the street. It means interesting stoops that people sit on. It, it, you know, great urban vitality, but it doesn't happen overnight. That's the issue. Because it takes a real pioneer to understand what a place could be like to buy into it early on. But that strategy needs to look at the character of the place. It needs to understand how it's going to relate to the neighborhoods around downtown. Because you don't want to destroy that character, which will be much lower density. Um, in, in the downtown, it's got to focus a lot on those one-of-a-kind cultural things and sports things that, could, that should always be downtown. Um, back in 1990, I, I worked on the relocation of the, um, of the uh, baseball stadium to downtown Baltimore. Camden Yards. First time in this generation that a baseball stadium, a major event uh, facility, went downtown. They built no parking because they just double used all the office uh, parking that was already down there. And in the previous year, the Baltimore Orioles drew one and a half million people to a ball team that was a pennant contender. When they opened up in downtown Baltimore, where people said, nobody's going to go to downtown Baltimore. It's too dangerous. It's too nasty. They drew three and a half million people for, w with a team that was, that was much worse. And they have never drawn less than three million ever since. Ninety percent of all baseball stadiums and all arenas have now gone downtown since, since, uh, since the Camden Yards and, and the performing arts centers and obviously convention centers and museums. They all need to go downtown because they perform better and they add to that urban complexity that makes these downtowns special. But the real driver is housing. Housing 60% of the built environment. And I'll come back to how that unfolds. There's also a good role. It, it, it's important to define the role for the public sector. Because the public sector needs to set the stage, but they can't take the leadership. It's what I refer to as a private-public partnership not a public-private partnership. And the main reason is, is that these successful downtowns that have turned around, my experience is that for every $1 of public money, there's 12 to $15 of private money. So following the old golden rule, he with the gold rules, the private sector has to be in the leadership. But there's a lot of things that the government needs to do, things such as transportation, parking, transit, um, the city may control lots of land that need to be put into circulation and invested in these private-public partnerships. They need to get the impact fees right. If you have impact fees, you should. Or if you don't have them, you should. But right now, again, the suburban stuff is massively subsidized. It's subsidized by the urban stuff. So at least we should have a level playing field for the suburban versus the downtown stuff. And again, the ratios are staggering. The, the experience I've seen throughout the country is that it's 9 to 1 as far as the subsidies out in the suburbs, up to 20 to 1. And we need to change that public policy. You might also consider tax increment financing. Works very well. Use your property taxes to pay back infrastructure improvements in these downtowns. But then the fourth thing that I would point out and, and all this is in a paper I just wrote for the Brookings Institution that I'll, I'll give you the website, um, is to make the right thing easy. What we did in downtown Albuquerque is we threw out the zoning code, just got rid of it. It was too complicated, it was silly, it was based upon conventional uh, development. You had things such as parking ratios that the city was telling you how much parking you had to do. Just let the market figure that out. And we put in a form-based code that encouraged pedestrian orientation. We have 21 principles. And if you follow those 21 principles, and my, my favorite one of the 21 is that your front door must face the sidewalk. That's all it says. And it has three pictures, one with the next through it, of what we mean by that. And if you, if you follow those 21 principles, you get your building permit in three weeks administratively, no politics. We're trying to make the right thing easy. And you make the wrong thing hard, too. Um, 
But just so you understand about codes in this country and, and the fact that walkable urbanity is illegal, in downtown Santa Fe, if the downtown would burn down, if those 650 shops and all the hotels and all the condos that are coming in burn down, what's on the code, what's on the books, what's legal is Surreal's Road. What is on the ground in downtown Santa Fe is illegal according to the zoning code of Santa Fe. And that's pretty much true throughout the country. Uh, there's a history to it, which we don't have time to go into. But it came out of Michigan State, and um, the number one donor to Michigan State happened to be General Motors. You can figure out the rest. <laughs> the um, fifth thing that's important as far as an infrastructure is, and you've got a business improvement district, you must have a BID, and that BID must have a decent budget. We, we passed a state law allowing a business improvement district for downtown and raised our property taxes on the private sector by about 8% and we raise $800,000 per year. A business improvement district is in essence a overlay on top of what the government can do to make it a safer, cleaner uh, place. It, it uh, promotes downtown, it puts on festivals, it closes the streets and have the, you know, where the farmer's market is run by the BID. BIDs, there's 1,200 of them throughout the country. Uh, a friend of mine back in New York, who's sort of the godfather of BIDs in this country, uh, with a business improvement district, redid Grand Central Terminal. And then a second BID redid Bryant Park, which is now the finest park in the country. All private sector uh, driven. And then the sixth thing that you might want to consider when you turn around a downtown is what I refer to as a catalytic development company a development company that, that presses the fast forward button, implements market driven things that the rest of the, of the conventional real estate community just doesn't get. And that's what we're doing in downtown Albuquerque with the company that I'm a partner in. But it's been done in downtown San Diego, which is a fabulous model. The Center City uh, Development Corporation, great model. Downtown Chattanooga with uh, River City Partners. These are great models of catalytic development companies that, that, that say, okay, we know it's never been done before, we're gonna do it anyway. And demonstrate to, to the rest of the real estate business that you can make a buck doing this. So with those six infrastructure steps put in place, the then issue is how do you reintroduce real, you know, again, the private sector is gonna do this stuff. They're gonna build most of this stuff and that's the 12, $15 to one. And it starts, what I've seen in the downtown turnarounds throughout the country that I've worked on, it starts with urban entertainment, however the market defines that. In downtown Albuquerque, that was a movie theater, and we have a Century 14, uh, restaurants, and an arena. And we have the, the first two were working desperately to get to the arena downtown. Um, once you have the urban entertainment, that's your there there, that gives you a reason to be downtown, to want to be there, there's something to walk to. And what comes next tends to be rental housing. And that's for the younger folks, people that, are, that feel like they're immortal, um, that they aren't scared off by all the scary images of downtown. And, um, and so rental housing tends to come in. And the interesting thing, downtown Albuquerque, when the first rental housing came in three years ago, it achieved rental rates 20% higher than anything in the suburbs. Pent up demand for it, it all leased up within the first month. Great pent up demand for this stuff. And why is there pent up demand? Because, I mean, it's, it, it's because conventional development has given us one option. You can either have suburban sprawl or you can have suburban sprawl. And for a lot of people, that's what they want. But the estimate is there's 30, 40% of us that want something different. It's a huge number. And one of the reasons that this, that this stuff downtown performs so well financially is because there's so little of it. And if there, you know, Adam Smith told us that if there's 30, 40% of us want this demand and there's only four, five, six percent of it available, the prices are gonna go through the roof. And that's what, what we've seen throughout the country. Um, in fact, the rental or the uh, for sale condo that is, is the, uh, the conversion of the old casino hotel into the for sale condo is um, selling for a price per square foot that I bet is well above the average in this town. Um, 
So then rental housing comes in and it begins to put more people on the street living downtown, making people feel like this is a place that they could live. It's at that point that we urge folks to think about an affordable housing strategy because it's going to become the most expensive place to live. And I'll talk uh, in just a second about how we've seen that affordable housing strategy uh, uh, possibly work. At that point, the old farts start to think they can move downtown. They can move their biggest asset downtown, people who are buying for sale housing. They tend to be, of course, young professionals, empty nesters. And, and if you think that that's a narrow market, um, there's only 25% of the households in this country that have kids living at home. The other 75% of us are empty nesters, are singles, are couples that don't have kids living at home. When I was growing up, it was just the opposite. But right now, 75% of us don't have kids living at home. They're not making decisions about schools, not making uh, decisions about backyards. With the rooftops, it's then that you begin to see local serving retail come in. And um, the big complaint in Albuquerque and the big complaint in all these downtown turnarounds is that there's no grocery store. Well, grocery stores are follower users. There's a spectrum of drivers and followers as far as real estate product. And grocery stores are followers. There, there have to be rooftops before you get a grocery store. And I wish that wasn't the case, but I also wish that I was 20 years younger. I also wish a lot of things, but the reality is you have to have the rooftops before you get the grocery store. Um, and then finally what comes last is the office and more employment. That don't push employment early in the turnaround process. Because the number one reason for why offices go where offices go is because the bosses live close by and the bosses live in the for sale housing. So you've got to get the, the bosses living downtown first before they will start bringing their, their jobs back downtown. And that's happening now in Denver, in Portland, Seattle, San Diego. A friend of mine built a luxury condo with, uh, uh, along with along with the first offices built in downtown Denver a couple years ago. And I mean, nobody ever thought that anybody living would ever see more offices built in downtown Denver. But in 2002, they did because so much for sale housing was in downtown Denver. Now, one of the things that, that Jenny wanted me to talk about was what does the product look like and how do you finance it? Because it's different. It's a, it's not the 19 standard product types. They're different looking things than you're used to seeing. And I want to show you four that may make some sense. And um, one is for sale housing or office over rental retail. That's a pretty typical new product type. Again, it's illegal. Developers don't understand how to do it. And you can't get financing for it. Other than that, it's easy to do. Um, this is a development that we're doing in downtown Albuquerque, and it's now built. Th this is about four or five months ago, six months ago. It's now finished. Um, I'm moving into this project myself, and this is a um, 41 units, um, and it sh lays out a concept we call burying the box. There are certain big boxes that we have to deal with in the modern world. Retail and, in this case, a parking deck. It's a 180,000 square foot, 630 space parking deck. Back to the left on the screen, the yellow with the uh, glass, um, uh, that's a parking deck. We had, we had control over the design of that parking deck that the city built for us. And we pushed it back from the sidewalk 45 feet. And in that 45 foot by 300 foot pad, which comes out to about, mm, about a third of an acre, undoubtedly a good deal smaller than most of your house lots, we put this 41 unit uh, project, rental retail on the ground floor, for sale office on the second floor, and for sale residential on the top four floors. It's about 150 units to the acre. The, the most dense thing in New Mexico uh, in the modern age uh, 
uh, is, is a 40 units to the acre, so this is, you know, uh, almost uh, four times as dense. The only comparable, actually, is the Taos Pueblo, um, which uh, was built in 1400. Um, <laughs> it was possibly the most dense housing project in North America until the flats were built in the Lower East Side in the 1880s. Uh, very high density project. This is almost as dense. Um, uh, another one is a is a um, rental office housing or or artist studios over retail, particularly in a rehab configuration. This is one of our projects. That on the ground floor we have restaurants. Upstairs we have 22 artist lofts. Artists, this is just work lofts, not live work, and. They're there at all sorts of strange times of the day and night and early morning and weekends, activating the street. Um, there are musicians in the uh, New Mexico Symphony. There are um, artists of all kinds, jewelry and, and painters and sculptor. And the interesting thing is, is that we don't have to deal with ADA requirements. We don't have, I mean, it's not a massive, expensive rehab. And it's financially feasible it makes sense financially to do. A third example here is um, bury the big retail box. And this is something that you tried to do with your Century Theater. Um, we did with our Century Theater. Your Century Theater had, a, you know, the geometry of the block was such that you just couldn't, it wasn't a big enough block to do what we did here. This here, this here is a full block. Jenny, that's the uh, Sunshine Building. And these blocks are 300 by 300, almost two acres in size. So there's a sizable blocks. And in the middle of this block, we put a 50,000 square foot movie theater. We buried it in the middle. And around it, we placed seven individually designed buildings. So there's the entrance into the movie theater, but it's pushed back from the street 60 feet, and we put, in the case of Central, we put two buildings on this street with retail on the ground floor, restaurants in this case, and two levels of, two levels of uh, office. This, that's another view that shows the Sunshine Building. I'm always pleased when people ask me, which is the old building, which is the new? And this is the back of the movie theater with the Chamber of Commerce up top, on the top floor, Thai restaurant, a day spa, our sales center for the for the uh, for the uh, the project I just showed you across the street, ice cream parlor, and we've completely buried that big box movie theater. And then a fourth model is something that you see a lot in Texas. It came out of Dallas. It's rental housing that buries the parking deck for the rental housing. And this is going to start construction towards the end of the month, or towards the end of the year. This is a parking deck that's been completely buried by th uh, three levels of, of uh, rental apartments and retail. And so people can park in there. And the other interesting thing is that we've, we're going to elevate the entire site two and a half feet and have stoops coming up so that we're activating the street all around it and, and, and the sidewalk all around it. I um, want to quickly show you the how much financing detail should we go into it? I think we're running. Okay. Um, let's not go through these numbers. I um, want to talk a little bit about what you can expect when you're financing this more complex stuff. It's really there's two sides to financing real estate. There's debt and there's equity. For those of you who have bought a house, there's your down payment and there's your mortgage. It's the same thing, debt and equity. You shouldn't have as much of a problem with your bank. Your banker will like this approach better. What you will have more problems with are your equity investors and yourself and your city and whoever else is participating in the equity side, the down payment side of this because you A, need more equity to make these things work because the more equity is going to go into a higher quality product. The reason it's higher quality is in the suburbs you build this stuff 
and you're driving past it at 45 miles an hour and it's back 150 feet, all it has to be is a giant billboard that screams, hey, there's a supermarket here, stop. That's all you need to do is get their attention. Downtown or in a walkable place, you're walking up against the brick wall. Somehow a plastic billboard architecture doesn't cut it. So it's a much higher quality product. That movie theater that I showed you, uh, I was in joint venture with a very large developer who wanted to build it for $35 a square foot hard cost for the shell. Now that won't mean much to you. We decided not to go forward with that joint venture. We built it at 80 bucks a square foot, more than twice the cost. Well, we had to have a lot more equity in the deal to finance that, to make it work. And that equity, besides having more equity in the deal, it has to be much more patient. And why it needs to be patient is to wait for that return, that blue line. It has to be patient for that long-term hold. You don't build things to flip them. You build things to hold them. As, as the downtown becomes better and better, why would you ever want to sell it? Um, there are lots more moving parts that can sidetrack a project. This, that, that, that uh, 41 unit project that we built took three years to get the financing together. That Silver Court rental apartment project was supposed to be out of the ground last year this time. It's going to be out of the ground towards the end of this year. Um, so the, pay, the developer has to be more patient, has to be able to support his or o, her overhead. That's one of the things you have to worry about. <laughs> and, um, and of course, observers assume that you're making a fortune when in fact you're barely keeping your head above water. And uh, many times your natural friends in the smart growth movement, in the environmental movement, in the affordable housing movement, they begin to think that you're really the enemy too because they have come to disbelieve that any developer would do anything that was positive for the community. The disadvantages is, as I say, it's more complex, it's probably illegal, so you've got to change, change the law. It takes you a lot of time. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the mixed-use development financing is much more difficult. More equity means that you, can only, that you do fewer deals. Um, the, the big issue, though, is achieving critical mass. Critical mass downtown is so important, and we're not there in downtown Albuquerque. It's where you're never going to fall back, that you've, that, that, that you've gotten to the point that that upward spiral has begun to create value. And it can take three, six, nine years. It takes a long time to hang in there, and it's kind of scary. And of course, your colleagues question your sanity about doing this. But the advantage is, is that, you, that if you're interested in building long-term wealth, this is the way to do it just got to be patient. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, you do have this emotion as a great asset that kicks in, that things will happen that you never could have happen out in the suburbs. The, the city may be an investor with you, hopefully a patient investor. You may be the good guy in town, surprisingly. Most developers get used to being the bad guys. The other thing for you that are trying to finance this way I have this aversion to risk. Um, I don't like to pledge my wife and my house and my kids to my banker. So I, I prefer to do things what's known as non-recourse, where if things go wrong, they can only take the building, they can't take your soul. Um, but bankers don't like that. But when you put 40% equity into the deal, which is far more than they've ever seen, will, they'll still ask you to take recourse exposure but after you say no four or five or 20 times, they'll finally get it through their heads that they're not going to get this, and they will give you non-recourse debt, which is a very nice thing. It really helps you sleep well at night. But most importantly, you really feel a lot better about what you're doing. Um, let me talk quickly about the unintended consequence of success, something we're just learning about. When you build these special places, there's this huge demand and very little supply, the prices go out of sight. And um, this is a, a, a New Yorker cartoon, and for those that can't see it, that it wasn't, a, that it wasn't an artist's loft, now it's a lawyer's loft. Um, that's what happens in our cities, and they're gonna, it's going to happen even more, even faster in the future. And what we've put in place is a concept we call value latching. 
in downtown Albuquerque. Um, it is whereby after a project achieves its projected returns, after that point, not up front, you don't burden the project up front, it's got enough burden on it up front with the higher construction quality and the higher risk, but after it, 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 it has achieved its financial projections, above that point it shares 20 to 40 percent of its upside profits, profits that it didn't expect to make. And we have a new organization called the Albuquerque Civic Trust that then borrows money now against those future cash flows to invest in affordable housing today. And it's a complex mechanism. We're just getting this underway. The Ford Foundation, Enterprise Foundation are working closely with us. M many of folks in the affordable housing world view this as, as a major model to deal with gentrification. Because gentrification is, the, is a good thing but it's got this unintended consequence, which is the affordable housing problem in our downtowns. Um, here's, um, on my website, you can get, in particular, the second article, Turning Around Downtown, 12 Steps. Uh, I tried to make it 10, I tried to make it 14, I would have taken 13, it's 12. Um, and, um, but it's a Brookings Institution paper uh, that lays out what we know. We now know how to turn around downtowns. Um, one of the things we're going to do for Brookings Institution is put together a, a ranking list for our downtowns throughout the country. And um, uh, the highest rank is platinum or gold, where its critical mass has been achieved, this upward spiral of value creation is being achieved. And I did a little subjective ranking of the 60 downtowns I have a pretty good feeling for. I did not do Reno because I, until today, didn't have a very good feeling for it. I just didn't know it. And um, um, of the 60 I know, 60% of them are platinum or gold. 20 years ago, of those 60, there'd be four that would have been in that category. Our downtowns are coming back and far more rapidly than most people think and we know how to turn them around. Uh, it's just a matter of willpower. Do you want to do it? Do you have the intention? So, um, as I say, this downtown has pleasantly surprised me. I did not expect what I saw uh, today. It's much more complex than I thought it was. You've got a lot of assets. Uh, they just, they probably need to be better managed. You probably need a strategy to really hone your, your various activities. But um, if I were an investor looking to invest, uh, this would be a very interesting place to invest, and I would consider it. Thank you very much. Well, those casinos are, the question is, given the fact that you have these casinos, some of them are failing, um, are there ways through regulations to, through CCNRs, covenant uh, conditions and uh, restrictions to help bring those back? I prefer the carrot, not the stick. And um, those are actually pretty interesting assets. Um, not the casinos themselves. I'm, I, I despise gambling, and I, I mean, not for any religious or any other reason. It's just six or eight percent of us are congenitally addicted to this stuff. And we'll, gambling, by the way, goes through an 80 year cycle in this country. We've gone through it five times over the last 400 years. And um, it takes about 80 years to figure it out again that gambling is really not too good for our society. A lot of people do some wacky things when they get addicted to it. We, I don't know how we're going to get rid of it this time, but, um, um, but the, oh, by the way, I have found this out back at Harvard Yard. The oldest building in Harvard Yard was, um, uh, that's still standing was built in 1740, and the, and the cornerstone says, paid for by the Massachusetts Lottery. <laughs> 
They always use education to justify gambling. It's been around a long time. Um, but what I saw today with the conversion of these now obsolete hotels into housing, tremendous asset. You couldn't afford to put that kind of for what they're building now at $250 a square foot or so, you couldn't afford to build for $300 to $350 a square foot if you built it new. So you've got this written down asset that is almost worthless. And you can, and a developer without any city subsidy has converted it into 120 units. And there's a second one I understand going on. So those assets are going to be very valuable and very interesting to see them as they convert. Um, the other thing which is interesting, I think, I'm not positive, I've, I've done a lot of work over the years in Las Vegas, not my favorite city, but um, is that, as you know, Las Vegas has turned into a massive urban entertainment complex. It's Broadway West. And gambling is becoming less and less important to the bottom line of the major corporations that control Las Vegas. Um, and um, um, so that urban entertainment in downtown Las Vegas is kicking off a massive luxury condo boom in Las Vegas. The same thing could happen here, that the casinos could realize that, that they have to move more into urban entertainment. That urban entertainment could be, you know, a lot of it's family oriented. It could be the urban entertainment that could be the same urban entertainment that we're trying to do in Albuquerque with an arena. Uh, but you have major corporations that could be investing in um, some interesting things downtown and get people out from behind the one-armed bandits and out onto the street. Yes? Yeah, when you, in Albuquerque, when you threw out the zoning rules and came up with your 16 or 17 or whatever criteria, Yeah. Um, is that on your website, what, the, what those are? Um, you can go to the city website for the, 20, the 2010 plan, and it's uh, www.cabq slash plan, and I think it's then slash publications slash down 2010. But if you just get to the planning department, cabq.gov, did I say org or com, or it's, it's gov, dot gov. Get to the planning uh, part of the website and look for the 2010 plan, and it's all there. Um, in the back. In a, a couple of places we've been in the last few years, uh, Fort Worth for one, they're downtown, they've done a lot of regentrification, but they have a great investment from the downtown property in private security, so when people are down there at night, they feel safe on the street. These are not public security people. And the same um, in um, San Antonio, they, their police department has put a great focus on uh, ways to keep uh, vagrants and gang activity and such out of the downtown core. Do you find that that's one of the, the basic things that they need in these areas is to figure out a way to provide the security where people will feel safe to come down? Absolutely. And that's one of the key functions of the Business Improvement District. That the Business Improvement District, the BID, which again you have set up, but my impression is I, I know even little enough to be dangerous, that, that you probably don't have enough budget for it. <coughs> that, the, um, that in downtown Albuquerque, we have this $800,000 per year budget, that we have safety ambassadors on the street seven days a week until 10 o'clock at night, and on weekends until midnight. And um, they're, they're dressed in a, in a little uniform with a straw hat, and they're wired to the police. Um, and they help with the vagrants and the homeless, steering them towards the shelters. They, um, you know, uh, break up fights. They bring the police in when they need to. And um, it's, and they're just a concierge service, if you will, downtown. And then the other side of the BID is the clean and safe teams with their power washers and, and, their, uh, and, their, and their street sweepers to clean up the downtown to a higher level of standard than what the city can, can do. It is critical to have a BID, a well-funded BID, to make these downtowns work. And again, there's 1,200 of them throughout the country. 
And just last week, we have a weekly task or a monthly task force meeting with the, with the city about downtown, and we just had it last week. And, and the chief of police came, and the captain with downtown, and we were, they were talking about how their community policing program's working and how they tie in with the business improvement district with the safety ambassadors. And they brought back foot patrols for the first time in 50 years in Albuquerque. They brought back horse patrols for the first time in 50 years in downtown Albuquerque. So it's working together with the police to find a community policing solution that works. Excellent lecture. I think uh, what you've said has a lot of potential in this community, but just glancing around, I don't see any of the council members or the mayor. Do you have any interaction with the government officials or anyone like you have any interaction with the Reno? Meet yours here? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the issue of public leadership. I, I, I can just tell you about Albuquerque and Chattanooga and a few other places where early in the process it was very important, the stars lined up and the mayor and the city councilor for the downtown and uh, other public officials got behind it. The one thing that I can guarantee you is that the stars will go out of alignment. And that's just democracy at work. They'll move on to something else that becomes the flavor of the month. And um, so uh, take advantage of it when you bring it together. Get things such as the zoning thrown out and get you know, other laws that you need changed up front and put in place a mechanism under the Business Improvement District that the private sector can take the leadership. Because the, you're going to have two problems with the public sector. One is lack of attention. The other is too much attention. The lack of attention you can almost deal with better than too much attention because the too much attention <laughs> means that, you know, right now we're dealing with our second mayor since our first strategy was put in place and our, and our second downtown city councilor. They didn't know what happened in 98 when this thing kicked off. Uh, they want, they believe that the previous incumbent was a bozo and everything that they supported must be bad. And, um, and then you just have the, the typical, you know, city councils. And again, this is not just Reno or Albuquerque. It's New York City. City councils are basically uh, grown-up versions of high school uh, city council, or uh, a student council. <laughs> and, and what happens is you, know, you take these nine people, you throw them together. They don't know each other at first. And they fall into camps. And last week, you gorged my favorite project, I'm going to get you this week, on your favorite project. It has nothing to do with the, with the merits of the case. It's very much to do with nine people that are mad at each other almost all the time. And again, it's democracy at work. So you get the stars lined up, get as many things in place as possible, and get the private sector in a position from a nonprofit point of view, for-profit point of view, to take the leadership. Yes? In 19 standard product types. Yeah, and so how do you sort of turn these developers on to different types of projects, smaller projects, you know, more infill, or are there just a certain number of developers in the country that'll do these kinds of projects and everybody else is not worth pursuing? The question was, are there developers out there to do the infill? Because most developers do the 19 standard product types, and particularly the national developers only do that. The publicly traded developers. I, I was on the board of two New York Stock Exchange real estate investment trusts, and they just do the 19 standard product types. If they try to get outside those silos, the investment bankers back on Wall Street beat the heck out of them. And then it's always bizarre to me, then those investment bankers walk home to the Upper East Side to where they live. I, um, it's really one of the strangest things. Um, but the, uh, the, there are developers out there. They're in the minority that get it. But as I mentioned earlier, what you might want to consider doing is creating a catalytic development company. 
And there's a few models out there. There's a, the public sector version is, as I mentioned earlier, the Center City Development Corporation in downtown San Diego. It's a separate entity, uh, city-owned, but with a separate board of directors. They have a degree of independence from the politics. They've done a magnificent job. And if you, I mean, I knew San Diego first in 1972. The only people in downtown San Diego were drunks, sailors, and prostitutes. That was it. And today, downtown San Diego, there are 70 new housing projects on the market today, rental and for sale. Next year, there'll be another 70. It feels like a small San Francisco. It's really amazing what's happened. Um, then the other model is a nonprofit model, which is the River City Corporation in downtown Chattanooga. Nonprofit organization funded by the local foundation to put its initial capital in. And they've done phenomenal things. The world's largest aquarium they built, freshwater uh, 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 place, um, you know, three million tourists per year, restaurants, retail, housing, a uh, variety of things that they've done. And then our model is a for-profit, non-profit joint venture. My for-profit company, Arcadia Land Company, joint ventured with our local foundation, the uh, McKean Charitable Foundation, and they made, a, made an $8 million investment out of their asset base into our company to take on the 12 square block district that we're redoing. So um, that's a way to demonstrate to the private sector that there's money to be made in downtown Reno. But I think, I mean, it's a California developer out of Los Angeles that's doing that uh, casino hotel conversion. Yes? Actually, this is a, a comment, um, and I think it's an opportune time based um, on the question that was raised earlier. And I would pose the issue to Jenny and to Dad, who um, are putting on these speakers' um, forums is the idea of perhaps at the end of the forum, after we've all been instructed, and so many of us have attended many of these, is perhaps have an open discussion at the end of Stacy's um, talk where we could share what we think would work. And I think that would be a wonderful time to invite the council to attend and, and listen to that. So it was mostly a comment that I wanted to see if there was some first um, crucial thoughts about that. About that. Uh, let's take one more, and then Chris has a 735 flight, so we're going to have to move. Um, I just ha had a quick question about sort of the role of distinctive architecture in this. It seems like the cool thing about Reno is that it's not Albuquerque or Chattanooga or <laughs> any of those other places, and that, you know, we've got this great river, and we've got the university, and we've also got gambling, and it seems like what's great about this town is its distinctiveness. And, and I've been to Chattanooga, and it, the buildings there look a lot like the buildings that you showed up there, and look a lot like the buildings in Walnut Creek where my parents live. And it seems like we're sort of creating this urban, uh, I guess, what's the role for a, a city to be distinctive and to go their own way and to have sort of a distinctive architecture that fits with their own city's image. It, it, as I mentioned earlier, it definitely needs to be homegrown from the dirt up, not transported. And um, that, um, you know, this should not be a cookie cutter. What should, however, occur is that it should be urbane. It should be pedestrian. It should be walkable. It should be up to the sidewalk. It should be retail on the ground floor when there's retail demand. It should, and when there's no retail demand, stoops to take you into the, uh, into the higher density of residential. But, and those are the things in the 21 principles that we adopted in Albuquerque. Now, personally, I don't, I'm not crazy about architectural styles. I mean, monitoring and, and, and mandating architectural styles. But that's me. And Albuquerque agrees with that. Santa Fe doesn't. Santa Fe has very strict you know, historical styles. The other example uh, we talked about earlier today is Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara has a very strict historic style, which I find also kind of cute because, well, both Santa Fe and Santa Barbara, it's like all history. It's fake. It's kind of like John Stewart. 
it's fake news, it's fake history. Um, that Santa Barbara's history, though, is the cutest one, because um, in the 1890s, a woman wrote a series of romance novels, the, the, uh, Ramo the uh, Ramona novels, of this mystical, made-up Spanish California. Think Disney and Zorro. <laughs> um, they, she just made it up out of thin air in the 1890s. Well, a, a group of citizens loved that image. You know, Santa Barbara was a typical, you know, adobe Victorian town. And in, I think it was 1823, eight, or 1923, 1924, they had a 60 second urban renewal event. <laughs> they had an earthquake, knocked down the town. And the head of the Ramona Society was put in charge of redevelopment <laughs> and put in place the, his, the historical style, which is Santa Barbara now. And well, Santa Fe's... I guess what I'm asking is, how do we get real history? Like, you know, Prague, <coughs> that's a cool city, and it's not fake. <laughs> well, actually, if you go back far enough, you'll find that it, it too, is fake. I mean, they had some pretty wacky uh, emperors that were in uh, Prague uh, throughout history in the Middle Ages. But um, uh, you've got a history here. And dig it up and find out what it is. If you want to go to the effort of a, of a historical styles. Me, personally, I just, I want to see it urbane. I want to see it walkable. And if somebody wants to come in, I mean, in Prague, the, one of the major bridges in the Prague, one of their favorite buildings right now is a Frank Gehry building that took the place of, of a building that, that burned down right on the corner, prominent intersection, gateway into Prague is a Frank Gehry building that was put up five years ago. I like that. As long as it addresses the street, as long as it's in the context, give me anything. Uh, it's, it's exciting. I just want the, want the uh, diversity. But if you want the style, that's your decision. Last question, then I'm okay, going to have to go. Okay. How did you get rid of the codes? How did you do that? How did you? We had a mayor, Jim Baca, who, it wasn't about the codes, it, it was a, another effort that came out of the strategy that we did in 98 that he was in charge of, and, but it applies to the, how we dealt with the code. He said, I'll take the hill, cover my backside. <laughs> uh, a very rare politician. <laughs> because what we have here, well, my opinion, here in Reno, is that the, the development of Reno is dictated by the Reno planning, but like you say, but not urbane and not visionary. And so everything looks like the code. And so I was wondering how you got past that. Because that's been the biggest obstacle right. is getting past that. But the, you know, focus on downtown, keep in mind you do have still that memory. You have all those picture books. I'm, I'm, I've, I've never seen a, a Reno. And, um, you know, that memory is so important. Um, the old Albuquerque High School was left vacant for 30 years. 1914 Albuquerque High School campus, about six buildings. Boarded up, pigeon infested, um, you know, barbed wire fence around it at the gateway into downtown. And no town that I know of would have ever left a building in that condition, both because of the liability and because it looked like hell. But they kept it because most of the city councilors went to high school there. <laughs> and it's now a rental apartment and for sale condo. Um, and it's that emotion that you really have to tap into. And it's that history.